Have you noticed that, uh, that, that life is full of responses? That we respond to things all the time. You can be driving in traffic and somebody cuts you off and you, you automatically respond. <laughs> to Now, depending on you know, how you're feeling at the moment determines maybe how you respond. Uh, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll uh, uh, true confessions, I'll get cut off in traffic or somebody will slam on their brakes for un- unknown reasons. Or they'll be texting when the light turns green. You ever had that one? And, and I, yes... Like I said, true confessions, I'll pull it next to him and I just have to look and say, and see, and sure enough, they're still on their phone. <laughs> and it's all I can do, not to just scowl, you know, but I just suppress it, you know, no need to, no need to be bitter. Uh, we respond to things uh, all the time. Somebody, um, just anytime, family, at work, whatever, somebody bumps you, you immediately kind of, you know, kind of well up, swell up, you know, it's like... Somebody just, you know, somebody pushes you, you push back. It's just, you know, that's how we, we are. Jesus um, has been uh, in, in this we call the Holy Week. These several, several chapters in Matthew uh, been doing a lot of responding because the Pharisees and Sadducees and other religious leaders are responding to him. He's been doing amazing things, but he's not doing it the way they expected. He's very unorthodox. He doesn't fit their mold. He doesn't, you know, he's not the kind of Jesus, the kind of Messiah, if you will, they were expecting, and so they're responding by confronting him time and time and time, and he responds to their aggression by just really just putting them in their place, and it's kind of amazing. We're going to see some of that today and how he responds to their uh, challenges to his authority and challenges to, to what he's doing, and they're just trying, always trying to ensnare him, and he responds every time. And I think about our lives. Before we get to the text, I think about, I think about us. As, as children of God, and how we come to Him with our objections. <laughs> we don't like the way He did something, or we, don't, we think we, we, we come to Him with some injustice in the world, and we think, how can you allow this? How can you do this? How, and what about my life? And we, it, whether it's personally or globally or somewhere in between. And we come with this, you know, kind of shaking our fist, and, and if we really listen, He responds with grace. In love. And, and like the perfect father that he is, he often will say, you've got to trust me. But it's hard to trust him if we don't know him. And it's hard to know him if we don't spend time with him. And that's, and that's, that's the challenge, isn't it? In our busy, busy world, busy, busy life that we have, spending time with our Lord and our Savior But, but I've found sometimes I go with the wrong heart. I don't go really wanting an answer. I just go to vent and just kind of get angry at him because I don't like him allowing for something in my life. And sometimes he disciplines me by just remaining quiet. And I have to just go back to the word and just fall on that and just be reminded of his love. And then when I'm reminded of his love and he says, just trust me, I'm like, okay. Because I know his heart I can trust his hand. And, and, that, and that makes it... It's amazing how he gives, he, gives, he gives us perspective when we go to him. It's when we don't go to him that we lose perspective. But if we will go to him, he'll give us perspective and help us to, to get a, just a glimpse that he knows what he's doing. <laughs> and then we realize how silly we are for challenging God. We don't understand everything. He never said that we would, but I think we we need to trust his heart when we don't understand his hand and and what he allows in this world. So here we are in, in, like I said, in Holy Week. This is Tuesday of Holy Week, and and Tuesday covers about four chapters in Matthew. Jesus had a lot to say, (laughs) a lot of conversations to have on Tuesday, And, and I believe that the Lord inspired that, uh, that Matthew would include many of those conversations because Jesus said some really significant things in his last week of earthly ministry among us. So the first thing we're going to see is, is in Matthew 22, when, when the Pharisees come and they challenge him, and they, they really, uh, they're going to conspire together. Um, and he's going to address that and just really, and they're, they're going to marvel, it says. They're going to be astonished. They're going to be amazed. All those things, every time at his responses. They went to him thinking they were going to catch him. 
and they were going to prove he wasn't the Messiah, that he wasn't the Son of God, that he was blaspheming. And every time he came back, because he has the wisdom of God, because he is God in the flesh. And so <clears throat> with that, let's look and see how this might apply to our lives and our conversations with our Lord. Verse 15 of Matthew 22. Then the Pharisees went and counseled together how they might trap him in what he said. And they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are truthful and teach the way of God in truth and defer to no one, for you are not partial to any. Now, this just, just sounds like they're just really just bringing a whole lot of puff, right? To just, you know, not very genuine. You can tell they're just being, just trying to flatter him and they're really ensnaring him trying to. Tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to give a poll tax to Caesar or not? And remember, the Romans were the oppressive, occupying nation over the Jews, and so they were pretty bitter, and some paid taxes and some didn't. They were, uh, especially the zealots who, who said, you know, that no, this is our country, you, you don't belong here, and, and we're not going to pay taxes. But Jesus perceived their malice, their wickedness, and said, why are you testing me, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the poll tax. And they brought him a denarius. He said to them, whose likeness, image, inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. Then he said to them, then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And hearing this, they marveled, and leaving him, they went away. They didn't have an answer for him. They were hoping that he would say something that they could peg him on, and they, they missed it once again. He's telling them, as Romans 13 tells us, that we need to abide by the laws of the land. Uh, pay your taxes. And, and we just came out, out of tax season uh, back in April. Some of, some of us perhaps are even doing quarterly taxes, uh, self-employed and otherwise. Uh, might pay taxes each quarter throughout the year. And some of us might be thinking, oh, wow, I did that extension until October. I still got a few months, <laughs> you know, whichever it may be. It's a godly thing to pay taxes. But that's not the point of what he tells them. He's, he, what he's basically saying is, look, Caesar's image is on the coin, so pay it. But he's also given them the, as he says, uh, the things that are Caesar's, and to God, the things that are God's. What he implies there is your hearts. Caesar's image is on the coin, but God's image is on people's hearts. We're made in the image of God. And he could tell their hearts are far from him. And so he, always wanting to reach, and even as confrontive as he is with the religious leaders whose hearts are so far away, he's wanting to reach them. He's wanting them to be reached for the kingdom. And God's image is on people's hearts. It's there. Romans 1 talks about how we have a knowledge of God, though we don't know Him personally. We're born into this world, though we are separated Him because of sin. We have a knowledge of God. We can look at the world around us. We can see it in the lives of people who know Him. We can see it in the creation, in the universe, in the stars, in the, in the things on earth that we see, in the creatures that He's made. So He's telling them that their problem is not with Caesar and whether or not they owe Caesar. Their problem is with God and whether or not God owns them. You're, you, the, the image of God is on you. He's wanting them to understand. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Do that part. But render to God the things that are God's. And again, he responds to their aggression, and they respond by just marveling and leaving him and going away. Go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Lord. You're going to come out <laughs> uh, more wise, hopefully, but definitely put in your place lovingly. That's always His heart. And then the other religious sect, known as the Sadducees, approach Him. Now, before we get into that section, understand the Sadducees were the ruling class of that day. The, the, the religious leaders who, who ruled uh, the others, if you will, they did not believe in resurrection, so they didn't believe in, in life after death. Uh, they didn't believe in angels. Um, they only believed that the Bible was the first five books of the, uh, of the Scripture, was only the first five books of the Bible, the 
Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and that was it. They didn't accept the major and minor prophets, the Psalms, and all. They, they only saw those first five as, as being the Word of God. So because they did not see in their personal belief system any afterlife, they were known for indulging their pleasures and loose living. And they were the religious leaders. <laughs> As children of God, we do believe in life after this life. And the Bible says, he who has this hope purifies himself. He who has this blessed assurance, we call it, purifies himself. When we know that we will be facing God, that helps us often to stay in line, doesn't it? And of course, he strengthens us and gives us self-control by his Holy Spirit. The Word says, he who has this hope, he who has this assurance, purifies himself. But here's the thing, the Sadducees did not have anything to look forward to, therefore, they led very immoral lives. This life was all there was, and so they had this very religious front, but they also were known for immoral living. And such was the story of some of us before we got saved. We didn't have any kind of hope for the hereafter. We thought maybe we just returned to dust, just died. Uh, there's something called annihilationism, uh, where you go to nothing. Nihil, nothing, Latin. You, you, and if, you, if you're a nihilist, you believe that you live in this life, and you're just here by chance, and you were created from stardust, as some say, or whatever got you here, and you live for a little while, you came out of primordial soup, and you evolved, and this life is just do whatever you want because you're just going to go back just like, oh, we're just an animal. What a, what a very sad perspective and existence that would be. And that can lead to very, and again, like I said, some of us may have that story ourselves that, that, that led to doing whatever is right in your own eyes, whatever you want to do. Versus if we truly believe that we will be answering to an almighty God and that there is life beyond this life, we will live very differently from that. And so the Sadducees, let's see their conversation with him, knowing their perspective. Okay, keep in mind that perspective I just gave you, their worldview, if you will. On that same day, Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him and questioned him, saying, Teacher, Moses said, If a man dies, having no children, his brother as next of kin shall marry his wife and raise up an offspring to his brother. And that's from Deuteronomy 25. And I'll give a little more detail on that in a minute. Now, there were seven brothers with us. And the first married and died, and having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. So also the second and the third, down to the seventh, and last of all, the woman died. In the resurrection, therefore, the one that they don't believe in, right? So again, they're doing the same thing. They're just not very, they're very pretentious uh, now as they're approaching him. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife of the seven shall she be? For they all had her. But Jesus answered and said to them, You are mistaken, not understanding the Scripture or the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. But regarding the resurrection of the dead, have you not read? I love when he confronts religious leaders who do know the word, at least they say they do, and he says, haven't you read your own Bible? <laughs> have you not read that which was spoken to you by God, saying, I am? And that's the key phrase in this whole section, I am. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the multitudes heard this, they were astonished. So now in the first case, the religious leaders were marveled, and now they marveled at his teaching. Now they're astonished. The multitudes are astonished at his teaching, just blown away by, by what he's telling them here. So back to what he said, and he quotes there in verse 24. He's quoting from Deuteronomy 25. And Deuteronomy 25 outlines the rules of this scenario that they brought him, so that because an inheritance was pretty much all that they had back in the day. That was, that was what they hoped in, was their inheritance. And so in this scenario... They were thinking, okay, the, if, a, if, a brother's, uh, if a brother has a brother who dies, he's supposed to take that, um, you know, the, the, the widow and marry her and then raise up a child, and that child will be the heir for his deceased brother. So it'll give that family an inheritance. Does that make sense? So 
that was, that's the scenario they were bringing to him. And if, by the way, that brother refused to follow the, the rules in Deuteronomy 25, then the widow could come, remove his sandal, slap him with it, and spit him in the face. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what it's, it's outlined in Deuteronomy 25. And so perhaps there were some guys walking around with one sandal and spit on their face who said, that, that guy didn't step up and do his responsibility, you know. But in this scenario, just imagine, you know, you're, you're going down and, and it's, it's, uh, one brother dies, the other brother dies. By the time you're at the third or fourth brother, it's like, I'll take the sandal and the slap. I'm not, I'm not marrying her. You know, she keeps, you know, black widow here, you know. She's, uh, husbands keep dying off. You know, I'm just, I'll just, I'll take the spit in the face. I don't mind the public shame. I'm just, I like my life just like it is. Thank you very much. But uh, just conjecture on that. Just wondering. And so he, again, he's confronted by these Sadducees, who, by the way, are Sadducee because they don't believe in resurrection. That's just in case you hadn't heard that one. That's, that's how you remember what the Sadducees believed. That's why they were Sadducee. But we believe, <laughs> as children of God, as Christians, as, as, as believers, we believe in bodily resurrection. Not that we will die and someday, someday just be floating around as disembodied spirits. The Bible doesn't support that. When Jesus appeared to the disciples after his resurrection, he said, here, touch. And he, he embraced them. He gave hugs. Um, and and but he, what he said was, he said, he didn't say flesh and blood. He said flesh and bone. He was referring to his body. He said flesh and bone. And so our new bodies won't have blood because the word says that the life of the body is in the blood. Well, that's what sustained us when we were only physical. Right now, we are sustained by blood. You bleed, what? To death. Or some, some way the blood gets tainted or toxic or septic or whatever, and, and, and you die that way. Different things happen. But when there's no blood, it's just flesh and bone. It's sustained by the life of God, by the breath of God. And that's what the resurrection body will be. So he says flesh and bone. We get brand new bodies, and, and all of us can be encouraged by that. With our, with our ailments, especially as we get older, and that we have, we're thankful that we get new bodies, brand spanking new, that will never hurt, that are never be afflicted, never challenged, never, never weak. It, it's, it's funny when you get in a conversation with a skeptic and they say, okay, Fine, I'm tracking with you on that idea of new bodies and all that, but the skeptics are always looking for, a, for a, an out, right? Or some reason not to believe, right? So, so what if somebody gets like a liver transplant and the person who donated their liver knows God and the person who got the liver doesn't? Does the liver like go to heaven? That's ridiculous. That's just a stupid question. But you'll have those kind of challenges. You know, is that, is that how it works? It's mysterious. But somebody can actually be cremated, and God is still going to pull miraculously. Notice, he said, you don't understand the power of God. Did you see where he said that? Verse 29. You don't understand the power of God. God is able to create out of nothing. So you know he can take everything that was us and pull it all together in a new body Sustained by His very breath, His Spirit, and bring it all back together. Amazing. It says we're going to be like the angels. He says they will be, in verse 30, like the angels in heaven. Meaning, they'll be, will be spiritual and physical. But it's kind of like when Jesus was having his post-resurrection appearances and kind of having fun with his resurrection body, he would actually just show up in a room. He just, boom, there he is. And then, like, he, for example, he's going on the road to Emmaus and he's talking and walking with a couple of folks and they're like talking about this Jesus and he's kind of playing dumb. He veils their understanding and, and of their sight to where they can see a person. They don't realize it's him. They walk along with him, and all of a sudden, then he goes, and he has, they invite him for dinner, and they have dinner. He breaks the bread, and he breaks the bread, a picture of his body being torn. They recognize him. As soon as they recognize him, he's, boop, he's out of there. <laughs> it's like, just having fun. We're going to get to do stuff like that. 
Well, you mean we'll get to move around the speed of light? I think it'll be more than the speed of light. I think it'll be like the speed of thought. You know, I want to be in Europe right now. <laughs> you know, and you're there. Like the angels in heaven. So we're going to be like the angels in our new resurrected bodies. But here's the thing. We're going to be very different from the angels in our understanding, in our experience, in our knowledge of God. The angels right now know God, right? They, they see Him face to face. They, they are hanging out with God. The angels are. There's some here, they said. The Bible says there's some around us all the time doing work in the world, right? Ministering, military angels, mighty, all those other M words that angels are. And, and the angels are seeing God face to face right now. But we're very different from angels in the respect that angels have never known sin. There was a third of the angels that fell. They sinned. They were cast out. That's the demons that are in the world now. Decided to worship Satan instead of worship God. But there are myriads and millions upon millions that didn't fall. They've never known sin. They've never known rebellion against God. And therefore... They've also not known redemption. They've not known what it's like to be saved, to be redeemed, to be made right with God, to be forgiven of their sin, because they never had sin. Does that make sense? So we're like the angels, and it will be physical and spiritual, like the angels is what he means there, but very unlike in experience. In 1 Peter 1, and also in Ephesians 3, you can make a note for homework, it says that angels long to look into what it's like to be redeemed. They long to know Listen, church, what you have experienced, that's really cool. We know something angels don't. We know what it feels like to be forgiven of our sin. We know what it feels like to be made right with God. Angels can't say that. So we got one up on them. <laughs> Bible even says that we, on the other side, will judge angels. That doesn't mean you're going to be judgmental. Now, let me just tell you if you're good or bad. No, that's, not, that's not it. It means that we'll have authority because of Christ to rule alongside and worship Him forever. But here's the thing. We, as people, as humans, were born in sin. We were dead in our spirits due to the sin of Adam that we inherited. This is why we must be born again of the Spirit. And as long as we are in this world, we are in these fallen bodies. Okay, so stay with me on this. As long as we're in this world, we're in these fallen bodies. So humanity needs to marry and have children because physical death is inevitable. That's why God said, go fill the earth, multiply and all that stuff, right? Because death was going to happen. Death is inevitable for all of us. So the only way for humanity to continue is through procreation. But in heaven, we'll be like the angels, and there's no need for marriage because there is no death there. We will be like the angels in this respect because our new bodies will have no sin, no death. We will have eternal bodies made for eternity. And like there is a fixed number of angels that God created. He created the angels in one day. All the angels. There's a fixed number that He made. There will also be a fixed number of believers in heaven for eternity. The redeemed of God. The bride of Christ. The church of the firstborn, we're called. And once the Father determines... Time as we know it will come to an end. Once the Father has said, time, time is up. This is the moment. And He knows when that hour is. Jesus said, I don't even know the time. Only the Father knows. And when, he tells, when the Father tells the Son, go get them, that's when time will be no more as we understand it. Once the Father determines, time as we know it will come to an end. The age of grace will give way to eternity. We're right now in the age of grace, the time at which 
God has chosen not to hold men's sins against them. In other words, a time in which anybody can come and get right with God, just as you are, and say, Lord, I don't, I've, I don't, I don't know how you can accept me, but according to what your word says, it's through your blood, through your sacrifice. Now is the day of salvation. That's why the word says today is the day of salvation. This season that we're in, we don't know how long it'll be. It may be a year, maybe an hour. It may be a hundred years that the Lord tarries. The word refers to the fullness of the Gentiles, the, the time that, that um, the Lord knows those who will be saved. He knows who are going to put their trust in Him. He has foreknowledge. He has that. And He has that number. We are with Him for eternity. So there's that, there's the resurrection, there's all these things that he brings them in just a few words, his wisdom upon them, and they walk away astonished. He tells them, you don't understand the power of God, Sadducees, because these brothers that you talk about are not going to be interested in marriage. It's no longer needed on the other side. He's helping them to understand. No sin, no effects of sin, just the glory of God. And then some come back with, yeah, but I really, want, I really want to know, you know, my husband. I really want to know my wife. I really want to know on the other side. We're not going to be dumber on the other side than we are now. We're going to know each other. It'll be different, though. Angels don't have children. And on the other side, we won't. It's that we will be all like the angels there together in the wonderful glory of God. And it'll be even better than what we know with any, uh, any kind of earthly ecstasy. We will know each other, but it'll be very different. And we'll know each other for eternity. He tells them, in effect, that in the resurrection, it will not be anything like what we know here. It's an entirely different world. In 1 Corinthians 2, it says, No eye has seen, no mind has conceived, nor has it entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for us in heaven. Like I said, the, the Sadducees believed in annihilation. So Jesus tells them that's ridiculous. And he tells them that by quoting their Bible to them. Look at it again in verse 32. He says, I am. He says, have you not read? Have you not read? Have you not, do you not know what your, your own scripture says? And it says, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He tells them, I am, because he wants them to know, I am, that is in their Bible, didn't say I was. I am is eternally existent. When asked his name by Moses, Moses, he told him, he said, I am that I am. He says, I am the God of the living. He tells them, God is not the God of the dead. Why does he tell them this? He says, I am the God of the living. He is the God of the living. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. At the end of verse 32. He tells them this because he wants them to understand that they are dead spiritually and they need resurrection. Adam and Eve were alive in body, soul, and spirit. But when they sinned, their light went out. The spirit died. And since then, we all inherited that same state. We are alive when we are born, physically and emotionally. We have a mind, will, and emotions. We were dead spiritually. That's why we must be born again. And that's, what, that's the message he's, he's wanting them to understand. He tells them, you don't understand your scripture. Your scripture is without error. It is perfect. It is God-inspired. And your word says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then the Pharisees, that he had, when the Pharisees heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they gathered themselves together. It's just back and forth. You know, which one can really get him? And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him. Now, now this is not 
a lawyer like we understand a lawyer, not somebody who's going to be in, in court and all that, and trying a case or representing and all. So uh, a lawyer is, is a scribe, uh, those who wrote down the word and transcribed uh, the word of God. But speaking of lawyers, um, um, what's, why, don't, why, don't lawyers, <laughs> why don't lawyers eat sharks? Did y'all hear that one? Professional courtesy? That's, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> no, lawyers are great. They're wonderful people, most of them. Um, and so this lawyer, this scribe is put up by the religious leader and says, hey, you go ask him. It's your turn. And they ask, testing him, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And by the way, this section we're going to wrap it up with is key to us understanding, responding to God. Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Let's pause there for today. So they come and they test him. And they say, tell us, which is the greatest commandment? Again, thinking that they're going to entrap him. And so he just quotes the Shema to them. Back in Deuteronomy chapter 6, you see, it says, The Lord our God is one, and you shall love the Lord with the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And Mark also puts in there, and with your strength. They prayed every day, especially the most pious among them, and quoted Deuteronomy 6.5. They knew that, like they just wake up in the middle of the night, they, they'd quote it anytime, any, even the smallest, even the kids knew that by rote, and they quoted it every day. So he turns and he says, okay, you already know it because you all got it memorized. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Some churches are really good. And by the way, what I believe for these folks, as well as for the church throughout history, it's a challenge to love God in all those ways. But I think what he's telling us is loving God requires balance. It requires loving Him in all three of these areas of our lives. Body, soul, and spirit. Some churches, uh, you've noticed, they definitely focus on loving God with all their heart. And you go and it's just wild. There's a whole lot of emotion going on and a whole lot of, sometimes it's just chaos. You ever been to those churches? I have. And it's just, it's kind of uncomfortable. There's just so much emotion. But there's not really a sound teaching of the word. Other churches you go to and there's no emotion, but there's a whole lot of teaching. And it's just like really intellectual. And it's like, okay, I'm not really um, inspired, but I'm educated. And there are others who focus on loving God with all their strength, who do a lot of the social gospel. They'll, they'll build buildings and build houses, and they'll go out and they'll do things. And that's good. The church should. But there's so much focus on the social gospel, there's not the Word of God gospel, and people aren't getting saved so often in those denominations and those churches because there's just so much focus on out there doing stuff. Yeah, we should be doing stuff. But we first need to be doing it from a heart that is right with God rather than doing things so that we can be right with God. Right? That just turns into religion. I believe the Lord wants us to love Him in all those ways. Yes, to love Him with all our heart, to love Him, but also to know Him and understand Him and understand His Word. And as a response to that, we go and we serve others in the world around us as He leads. The key to what Jesus is telling them, and the key to what He's telling us, 
has everything to do with His love. Because I don't know about you, but I read verse 37, and it kind of feels like pressure. I, I don't have it in me to love God with my heart and my soul and my mind and my strength. I don't have it in me to do that. Are y'all with me on that? Do you feel like a little like, kind of like, whew, that's, that's, a, that's, that's a pretty high, tall order. When the Lord says, love God this way, I've got some good news for you. You don't have to. Well, didn't Jesus just say, yeah, but here's the context of what he's saying. We are wired, as I said at the beginning, to respond to stuff. It just in our life, we're responders. And when we understand what God has done for us in Christ Jesus and the love that He displayed for us on the cross, we will respond with verse 37, with what it says to do. It's not that we come to Him without understanding what He's done for us and just do these things, because that's what He said we're supposed to do. First, we understand how much He loves us. When our hearts and our minds are captured by God, He will have our hands, our eyes, our feet, our strength. When He has gotten our hearts, He'll have everything else. Because we won't do anything, we won't want to do anything that will affect and have a uh, divide us and separate us from that relationship and that fellowship with Him. Over in 1 John chapter 4, there's a passage, I believe, that will hopefully bring all this together for us. It says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And everybody that loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Now again, that's sort of the same kind of vibe I get from reading that other passage. It says love, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. This also says love one another. Love is from God. Okay, that's great. How? Verse 9. By this the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we loved God. In this is love, not that we loved God, not that we got to take, check that off the checklist. Okay, good, I'm loving God. I did what Jesus said. But that He loved us and sent His Son to be a sacrifice for our sin. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has beheld God at any time, but if we love one another, God abides in us and His love is perfected in us. So the key to our loving God is responding to Him loving us. Then, what He said in the Shema, quoting from there over in Matthew 22, is doable. And only then. It's when we realize, when we have a grasp on, when we get our handle on, that He loved us so much that He would rather die for us than live without us. Then we get it. Then the light goes on. It's like, okay. Here's the thing. Whether you've read about it in the Bible or seen it portrayed in a movie, you've seen or read about how when the Father or rather when the Son, when Jesus was going through His uh, betrayal by the disciples, His trial before the, the Romans and the Jews, His being brutalized and scourged, being um, taken to the cross and killed, the Father did not intervene. That was His Son. And he stayed silent. That looks to me like hate. But then something that the movies could never portray happened. 
on the cross. Not only did he remain silent and not rescue him while he was ripped to shreds at the scourging, which movies aren't actually able to depict because it says his face was marred more than any man ever. But the, what the movies could not depict was what happened next. And it was when everything uh, grew dark and an earthquake occurred that the Father poured the wrath of God onto the Son. And every sin that you've ever done, every sin that I've ever done, every perverted thought, every betrayal, every rage blow up that we've had, every theft, every wicked thought, every, you just imagine. Imagine the most evil person in the world all the way to you, even to the best person in the world, everybody. Is stands guilty before a holy God. And this is love. So that He could accept you and make you perfect in His sight, He slew His Son. Isaiah says, it was the Father's pleasure to pour His wrath on the Son. Why? Because He loves you. And he knew he had to take on flesh so that he could take your place and my place. While the son suffered and died, the father was silent. And he poured out his wrath on him. An act of cruelty? No. It was an act of justice. Because that wrath was the wrath that you and I deserved. The anger of God that came down on Jesus was not anger at Jesus. It was on sin because sin had separated us from God. And he knew he wanted to embrace us again. He wanted to have fellowship again. He wanted to invite us into his presence, into the Holy of Holies once again. And the only way to do that was to make a way through a sacrifice, through the blood of Christ, every lamb, goat, ram, bull, heifer that was sacrificed in the Old Testament all pointed to the cross of Christ, that it was only through the blood they were able to enter in. Through His righteousness, not ours. Greater love has no one than this, that He would lay down His life for His friends. And Jesus said, I've called you friends. And He laid down His life so that we would be able to have fellowship with Him once again. We lost it. We were born separate from Him. It's been said, speaking of being born again, that if you are born once, you will die twice. If you're born only physically, you will die physically and you will die spiritually, eternally separate from God. But if you are born twice, you will only die once. Born physically and born of the Spirit, where the Spirit of God comes to live within us and resurrects us spiritually, we will only die physically. We'll simply pass from life to life, just a blink, just a moment. From the moment we pass from this life to the next, we will never die. And the hope that Jesus wanted to give the skeptics, the critics, the unbelieving, here as we see his confrontations, some of them did respond to him. They saw the hope he was offering. They saw the promise he was providing. And they were saved. They, they were believers. They were resurrected. Because as they were resurrected in spirit, they then, then had the promise of being resurrected bodily. And so he brings to us the same offer, if you will, He, show, he tells us the truth and he says, now it's up to you to respond. To respond to his grace, to his love, to his passion for you. He longs. The word is full of his heart for us. And he longs to spend time with us again. Just to be with us. Not only in, on the other side in heaven, but right now. And the only way to do that is through the blood of Christ. Jesus 
wrapped up his conversation with the scribe and the others looking on. And he said, the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And it does go in that order. First you realize how much God loves you. Then you are freed up to love him with your heart, mind, and strength. Then after that, you're able to love your neighbor in that order, in that sequence. By the way, that's also not a New Testament verse. He's quoting from the Old Testament from Leviticus 19, love your neighbor as yourself. If you didn't know, that's an Old Testament command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Well, yeah, but I don't, I don't, I don't really love myself. Uh, yeah, you do. Everybody, <laughs> everybody loves themselves. We all love ourselves. We pamper ourselves, right? Love your neighbor as yourself, but we need the love of God in order to do that. Love is seen by laying down our own preferences, our own schedules, our own interests. If we see that somebody else needs a helping hand, needs to be served, needs to be blessed, needs a meal, Whatever we are led by the Holy Spirit to give and to, to sacrifice, time, finances, whatever it is, God says, love them. And you don't have to like them to love them, by the way. It doesn't say like your neighbor as yourself. <laughs> it says love your neighbor as yourself. Take care. You take care of yourself. Who has God put in your path that you could love, that you could serve, that you could bless? That's what it means. But remember, it comes after we've understood God's love for us. And we love Him back. And we love Him back by loving others. Jesus told those who would listen a little bit to help them understand about loving others. He said, as you've done it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. And that's when the love of God is seen. We serve and love one another. So homework, read first John. That's my conclusion. Take some time this week to read first John and get a handle on Get a fresh appreciation for God's love for you. And let me just say this final thought, and we'll pray. God loves you, and there's nothing you can do about it. You can't make Him love you more, and guess what? You can't make Him love you less. His love is eternal. It is all-powerful. It is, I say it all the time, it's unconditional. Not to be cliche, but that means that he loves you and there's nothing you can do about it. You can't make him unlove you. So spend some time this week just getting back in tune with that. Let's all stand and let's pray. And Lord, as we pray, our hearts are challenged. I know I forget. I get away from I lose sight of your love for me. I know you love me. But Lord, to spend time in your presence and worshiping and, and getting in the word and just really remembering, it takes discipline. It takes, it takes me sacrificing some time to sit at your feet and to really hear your heart. Lord, I pray that you would Find us this week responding to your love by loving you back. To love you with our heart. To bring our, our cares and our sadness to you. To bring our joys to you and thank you for those things. To love you with our minds. To make sure we don't put junk in front of our eyes. 
to make sure we are guarding our minds for your glory, to love you with our minds and to love you with our strength by serving others and serving you as we serve others. But I do pray that everyone who hears this message would do all these things in your strength as we respond to your grace, your love, your passion. Because you love us. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.